most of you know that I, that I am a teacher, but um, before I started teaching, I, um, I spent three years studying biological science. So looking at animals is quite a bit of a, bit of a hobby of, of mine. And during the three years that I spent at university, um, every day I'd sort of be taught that all these wonderful things came about through the re result of evolution. The problem was for my lecturers was that the more I looked at it, the more I could see that it was, in, it was the case of an intelligent uh, design. But why then would we look at animals in regards in, to, to help our spiritual growth? Well, uh, the way that our creator has, has created uh, these creatures, they reflect the intelligent mind of the creator. So our premise tonight is to use the aspects of the animals that we're looking at to show how that we might develop our own selves. And if we, if we consider the, the example of Job, God spoke, when God spoke to him, he listed all these animals and all the attributes of all these animals and Job realised his place before God. And in the, the focus reading that we had tonight, the basic premise of that is, is that men and women, when, the, when we come before our Creator, we realise our own place before God. But it's, it's more than that. Having recognition of that also allows us to then partake in God's glory. So tonight I'd like to look at four creatures, quite small, quite insignificant in many respects, but they're four creatures that possess attributes for our physical, our emotional, our social, our spiritual and our moral capacity to grow. And the four creatures are up there on the screen. From left to right, can anybody say which they are? The first one's fairly easy. <laughs> okay, the million dollar question from left to right is that the first one is, is the ant, the second one looks a little bit like a coney, it's correctly called the hyrax, uh, the third is a locust and the fourth is a gecko eating a spider. Um, and I've used, the, I've used the picture of the gecko and the spider and hopefully you'll, you'll realise uh, why, I've, why I've used that later on in the, in, in the show. But as I said, the basic premise is up there, which is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay, these four creatures didn't just sort of happen out of, out of the top of my head. They actually came from a passage in Proverbs chapter 30. And this is quoting from the ESV. And Solomon writes, Four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. The rock badgers, or the high racks, are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank or in bands. The lizard, and the AV renders this as spider, hence the picture of the gecko and the spider, the lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in king's palaces. So what is this exactly telling us? Let's have a look at what exceedingly wise means. The word exceedingly is not necessarily a word that we use often. In fact, it, it lost popularity about 20 or 30 years ago. It was more popular around about the, uh, the, the start of the 20th century. But exceedingly means to go to, to, go to the utmost. And from wise, the, a, the margin in the AV renders it as wise made wise. And this, this expression suggests growth and development. It's not something that is here and now and, will let, and forever will be, but it's something that will develop um, over time. Our basic premise from Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, where we start by looking at wisdom, Solomon writes that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. When, when our Lord sent his, his disciples out to preach the gospel, he said to them, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, 
Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And again there's the animal reference there. And finally, um, in one of our Lord's parables, he finished off by this. He said, The children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So it behoves us then to find out more about becoming exceedingly wise so that we might not only flourish as vessels in this life but also for the life to come, reflecting God's glory, of course. So my question for us tonight is, how could we become exceedingly wise now, tomorrow or next week? Another question to consider is, why look at these four creatures? What's so special about them? We're told that the ant is not strong or mighty. We're told that the hyrax is feeble. We're told that the locusts has no king or leader. And we're also taught that the, that the lizard can be caught in the hand. There's nothing, uh, nothing particularly significant about these creatures at all. However, the ants do prepare their food in the summer. The hyrax makes their homes in the rock. The locust is able to march in bands. And the lizard can be found in king's palaces. So what does this exactly mean? Well, I, be- I would suggest to you that they, they show attributes necessary for a believer's faith and their interaction with their community. And what I've done is, and this is only a suggestion of course, is taken each of the attributes of these four creatures and to prepare shows an ordinance. Solomon liked talking about ants, so I've gone with the same thing. Reliance. Alliance, regarding the locust. And perseverance for the, uh, for the gecko or for the spider. Okay, now, our YouTube clip doesn't quite work, but this is a David Attenborough clip and it's actually showing some ants um, in the mangroves of Australia. And the clip just talks about how after, after the floods, the ants are able to rebuild their nest. They, they build their nest in such a way that the, that the water doesn't come in and, and then after, when the, the floods recede, the ants come out and they, they gather their food. Um, so that was just a little clip, but you can um, easily type that into, into Google. And let's move on to the next, next slide. Okay, so let's have a look at ordinance for the ant. As a creature, and the ant is globally widespread. You can find it in every, every country, every continent bar Antarctica. The ant is quite successful in that it is able to occupy a wide range of ecological niches so it can live just about anywhere. Um, another reason uh, why it's an interesting thing to consider is because it's able to exploit a diversity of food resources. Some ants are strictly herbivores, some are carnivores and some are scavengers and some are also omnivores so they'll eat a mixture of either um, plant material or, um, or meat. Well, many species of ants are able to form symbiotic relationships. So that means that in the case of one particular species of ant, um, they live in, a, in the acacia tree. And what happens is that the, the tree has got enough uh, hollows inside the, inside the trunk where the ants are able to live. Now that provides a home for the ants. Um, and the ants are able to, to take the sap from the tree for, for sustenance. The benefit for the tree is that it, the ant serves as a defence mechanism against any predators um, that might want to, uh, to, to eat the tree. Another example you might have seen, say, out on the, on the rose bushes, the aphids, and then you see the ants coming along. They'll actually um, milk the aphids for, their, uh, for, the, for the honey secretion that the, the aphids uh, give out. And of course, then the aphids, are, they get protection uh, from the ants. 
Some species of ants show farming techniques. There are a couple of species of ants which um, actually farm fungus, uh, believe it or not. Um, they are able to secrete a, a kind of antibiotic which stops the fungus from, from rotting. And other species of ants are also able to use manure to help um, to fertilise um, their environment. Some ants will also take seeds down into their burrows and even though they are predominantly there for, for a food source, those seeds, if they are, are left, um, will actually sprout. And so, um, and so the cycle of life for the plant continues. When an ant goes out to search for food, the scout ants will go out, they go in a, in a fairly haphazard random um, on a trail. Once they find the food, they're able to make a beeline more or less straight back to the nest, um, despite the, uh, the, the random uh, route that they took in the first place. On the way, they'll actually leave um, scent or pheromones along the way so that any other ants that come out are able to follow that trail straight to the, to the food source. So this is all their preparation of, of their food for the, in, the, in the summer. And ants are also able to be, um, become a super colony. So what that means is that, the, for example, the Argentine ant, which is actually a pest here in, in Australia, comes from, the, um, comes from South America. But studies have shown that species of the Argentine ant found in Europe America and Japan all are all the are all the same. So that's led scientists to, to say that this um, they've all got the same chemical um, composition. Um, so they're all part of the one big one big group. And I thought, how fitting that is that for us as the body of Christ? It doesn't matter whether we're here in Australia. It doesn't matter whether we're in New Zealand or, or the, the United States. We're all part of that one body. So on a spiritual um, level, ordinance means an orderly arrangement, a preparation or a provision. As far as scripture is concerned, the word prepare or, uh, in the Hebrew is to make ready or establish. If we have a look at Jeremiah chapter 10 and we can see how God prepared his creation. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12. God hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. God's purpose in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. So this is uh, in regards to the, the Davidic promise in relation to that. But God says in verse 24 of 1 Chronicles 17, Let it even be established that thy name, sorry this is David speaking, Let it even be established that thy name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel. And let the house of David thy servant be established before thee. We won't look at every single one of these uh, quotes, but um, the Apostle Paul talks about the need for purging when he wrote to Timothy. So again, that preparing um, of our mind and of our lives. The necessity of a prepared mind over in Second Chronicles, in chapter 30. And this is when Hezekiah um, was, uh, was, was establishing the, the Passover. Second Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 18. A multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God. 
the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And of course there's many passages in scripture that tell us about the preparation for the coming of the Lord and in Mark chapter 1 we're introduced uh, to the ministry of John the Baptist who was preparing the way of the Lord and even in times of trial or in times of winter um, as the ant faces still remaining resolute so that hopefully in our times of good or our times of um, our spiritual prosperity so to speak we've built up enough um, spiritual preparation in our lives so that when dark times do come upon us we are able to remain resolute. So our question is how could we better prepare ourselves whether that be now, tomorrow or next week? Moving on to the, to the Hyrax or the, or the Rock Badger. Again, this is another David Attenborough clip. But there's a, a little Hyrax who's running away, from a, running away from a Jaguar, also running away from an eagle and takes um, its refuge in amongst the rocks. As a creature, the Hyrax is only about 30 to 50 centimetres long and it only weighs about 4 to 5 kilos, so about the size of a, of a, of a domestic cat. It's vegetarian. Um, the hyrax is neither a rodent or a ruminant, so it doesn't chew the cud, um, and nor does it nor does it gnaw at plant matter. Taxonomically, it's related to the elephant, uh, believe it or not. Um, it's quite agile. It has the ability to climb well, due to the special pads on on its feet. It's diurnal, which means that it, um, it operates during the day. And its natural enemies include eagles, pythons and large cats. So with no actual defence mechanism that it itself possesses, it has to rely on the rocks to hide from eagles um, and to get away from pythons and, and any large cats. Reliance means to be reliant, be dependent, have confidence, to trust, to set your mind upon what is deemed as sufficient support or authority. So while the Hyrax is able to rely upon the rocks in which it, it lives, we're asked to place our, uh, our, uh, our, our confidence in the stronghold of Yahweh for our security. Um, the Psalmist talks quite a lot about the rocks. He's, he mentions that our rock is our source of deliverance. He mentions that it is our shelter, our refuge, our sanctuary. Our Lord says that we have to have a foundation upon rock. But we should not put our confidence upon this kind of rock. So let's have a look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse 6. This is the, the parable of the sower. Some seed fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And then over in verse 13, they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. And there's a similar um, concept in Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 3. So a question might be is where are we placing our confidence? What rock are we relying upon in our lives? The, um, the concept of making the house is also something to consider. In Proverbs chapter 9 verse 1 we're told about how the house is actually built. It 
says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 1 that wisdom hath, wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her, her seven pillars. This house is something which is accessible because of God's mercy. And there's a few more uh, references here in the Psalms where it talks about the house or God's house is a place to be desired. It's a place of worship. It's a place of defence. It's a place of plenty. And we'll have a look at the Psalm 52 and verse 8 reference. Psalm 52 and verse 8 where we read that I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. So the idea of that green olive tree constantly growing with the opportunity to mature and also to develop as a family. Um, This particular clip was of, it started off with just a I guess a handful of of locusts in a swarm but as the clip developed you could actually see these bands of locusts moving across across the ground and it was quite um, quite fascinating to watch Um, but uh, as as the time lapse um, um, occurred these bands these these gradual bands were were growing and and developing and um, and uh, and destroying the, the the green landscape but a locust um the problems with locusts happen when, when, we, when we reach the swarming or the gregarious phase of certain species of shorthorned grasshoppers. And what happens is that the swarms occur when there's an overcrowding in the colony. And so what happens is that as each member, each individual comes into contact with, it, with its mates, uh, the, the increased contact, the, the, the higher frequency of the, of the contact within a given time causes this swarming to occur. And now during this this swarming phase, the locusts will secrete a toxin that makes them inedible. Um, Swarms can travel great distances, up to 500 kilometres on on their rampage. And the largest recorded swarm covered about 510,000 square kilometres. Um, it was estimated to comprise 12.5 trillion insects and it was estimated to weigh about 27.5 million tonnes. So these small but ins- insignificant insects causing that great havoc um, on, on such a magni- magnificent scale. There's act- based upon um, locusts and also other creatures which, which um, exist in, in, in swarms, there's something called swarm theory which works like this is that there's something called swarm intelligence in other words it's the collective intelligence which is uh, caught, which is brought about by the stimulus and response of the individual so every everybody in that group is important they're able to contribute something to the group it's reliance on countless interactions between individuals and so the frequency is very much a determinant factor. So how often um, we have contact with each other in our group will determine how often something happens. Now the benefits to, to swarm theory include increased chances of finding food, uh, detecting predators, uh, locating a mate and also migration. It's much easier, of course, to to travel um, in in a group. And it's also been used to study social and political groups. This writer, Peter Miller, wrote in National Geographic that collective intelligence, he says that crowds tend to be wise only if individual members act responsibly and make their own decisions. A group won't be smart if its members imitate one another 
slavishly follow fads or wait for someone to tell them what to do. When a group is being intelligent, whether it's made up of ants or attorneys, it relies on its members to do their own part. And I thought, how fitting is that? As the body of Christ, we're all, we all have our own characteristics and yet we're all able to function as a whole body, despite whether we're legs or arms or feet or eyes. So the alliance is the state of being allied or, or it's causing a union or connection of interests between families, states, parties, etc. In Hebrew, bands means gathered together to divide, be cut off, finished or to shoot arrows. And if you've ever seen swarms of locusts and how they, how they march in bands, it's very much like that. As a band, they'll actually separate um, the ground, as it were, or the, or the landscape before them. But then I thought, well, what about the influence of God's word? Let's have a look at a very famous quote, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. If we're taking this intelligence from the Creator and using it in a collective manner. Hebrews 4 verse 12, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Our Lord spoke time and time again of the necessity of remaining united. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and starting at verse 25. says, Jesus knew the, the Sanhedrin's thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges." But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? And here's the crux of the matter in verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So the question for us is, as a collective group, are we dividing amongst ourselves or are we working together to divide the, uh, the influence of evil? There was a problem in Corinth where um, the, the, the brethren and sisters were, were forming little groups, little cliques, because some were saying, well, I was baptised of Apollos, some others were saying, well, I was baptised of someone else. And Paul wrote to them and said, look, it's not how it works. You are all part of the body of Christ. And he went on to talk to them about how, how important it was to be united, to achieve a collective purpose. We'll have a look at that, considering that was um, part of our focus reading for this evening. In, back in 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. And in verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We'll 
flip over to Ephesians chapter 4 and then we'll finish off with um, Galatians there. Ephesians chapter 4 and starting at verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then back in Galatians chapter 3. And verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This quote from Psalm 122, I think, uh, sums it up quite nicely. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. So the question from the locust is, how could we be better united? Now? Tomorrow? Or next week? Finishing off here with the lizard. Um, The lizard is found in warm climates. Um, It's able to communicate um, with each other through chirping sounds. It can lose its tails, something called autotomy. Anybody here study physics? Nobody? Okay. How is it able to stick to smooth surfaces? Well, it's something called the Van der Waals force, which is found in its specialised toe pads, so again, the proof of an, of an intelligent designer, to adhere to smooth and vertical surfaces. And what that work, how that works is like this. Each atom within our body is made up of positive and negative um, elements or um, electrons. So sometimes our atoms are charged negatively, sometimes our atoms are charged positively and um, opposites attract. So what happens is that the atoms are attracted in our body to each other through the positive and the negative forces um, being, att- being attracted to each other. So in, in, the, um, in the feet of the, of, the, of the gecko, it's able to adhere, to stick to the surface on which it, on which it um, travels upon, basically due to the, the Van der Waals force. How then does it prevent itself from being stuck there permanently? Well, the toes have been arranged in digital hyperextension so that it's able to overcome that. And just another interesting fact is that the lizards are able to replace each of their 100 teeth every three to four months. Perseverance means a persistence in anything undertaken. Looking at the word from the Greek, it means to stand firm, to keep one standing. And there's a few quotes there about talking about that. Romans and Colossians advise us to continue to persevere, to not faint, which is another, another uh, word there for perseverance. In the Proverbs, it talks about holding strongly in other words, from going away. In other words, taking hold of it and not letting go. And a similar uh, theme there is found in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Actually, while we're in, in Galatians, let's flip across to, to, um, to that reference. 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, where Paul writes, Prove all things, hold fast, 
that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our question from the lizard is how could we show greater perseverance either now, tomorrow or next week? So if we consider those four, those four creatures and the, the, the attributes that they, sh- they teach us, whether it's the um, preparation through ordinance, reliance, alliance or perseverance, where is this going to take us? Well, our focus reading for this evening was to show to us that our place before God is that we cannot own any wisdom of our own selves. Our place before God is that that God is is in control and that God has chosen the base things of the world to to confound the things which are mighty. So this quote from Jeremiah chapter 9 really sums it up. The Lord says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts Boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord.